You guys ready to jump in the word this morning? Okay, um, Tim and I are really excited to um, uh, co-teach this morning and co-coach us as a church family. And so we're going to do a tag this morning. And so I'm really excited because we've never done this before. And we're going to um, open up and we're actually going to have a, di- a family discussion around what the scripture says um, around kingdom giving. Okay, so as, as many of you know, we've been starting to emphasize um, being a church family that lives out a culture of discipleship. So it's one thing to have a strategy of discipleship, but it's another thing to manifest naturally, organically, a culture of discipleship. And you'll find in the scriptures that discipleship and the Holy Spirit always end up with the same goal. The Holy Spirit is in you so you can become like Jesus, so you live like Jesus, so you act like Jesus. You, you do what the rabbi does. That's what it means to be a disciple. You live how the rabbi lives. You think how the rabbi thinks. You act how the rabbi acts. You relate how the rabbi relates. That's what it means to be a disciple. So the Holy Spirit is in you so you can become more like Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is on you so you can do the works of Jesus. It's this relational life of being one with the Father, through Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, where you're becoming more and more like him each and every day. And the vehicle of discipleship is how we as the body of Christ partner with the Holy Spirit to take people from their actual circumstances and situations and where they're at in life and their maturity, and we take them on a journey into a transition of becoming fully manifested in who they are because of Jesus and at the cross. How many have met a, a, a um, 20-year-old Christian that is only one years old? It's a sad day. You know why that 20-year-old Christian stayed one year old in their maturity and their faith in God? Because they didn't walk out the journey of discipleship. And that's why we're, we're really hitting hard as a church family, this, this understanding of a culture of discipleship. So, now, giving is a discipleship issue, and it's a discipleship issue for many reasons. It's one of the most radical things you can do as a disciple to walk in the opposite sphere of the culture today and participate in the plans of God in your life. So, if you look, today's culture is plagued by three things. One, entitlement. Two, consumerism. Three, control. Okay, those things in particular is actually what will stunt a a disciple's growth and keep you from maturing in God and keep you from advancing in every area of your life as you follow Jesus and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Unless you lay down control, unless you lay down consumerism and entitlement, you'll find yourself stuck in an area of life that God wants to bless and bring you in kingdom abundance. So I believe the scripture is very clear. God wants to bless you and not just bless you a little. He wants you to bless you abundantly. Everybody say abundance. His kingdom is a kingdom of abundance. There's a boatload of abundance in both body, soul, and spirit. All right? And the reality is he wants you to live out a life full of harvest and fruit. But there is also this understanding, a harvest does not come unless we're a people that plant seed. There is no harvest without seed. So there is no kingdom advancement in your life without the giving and the planting of seed. And that's why giving is so important. So the reality is, there, um, a kingdom advancement actually requires something of us. And we've taught a lot on this. So, but I'm going to list four things quickly of what the scripture has to say about um, living a life of kingdom abundance. And I'm going to start my timer here. So I'm careful so we have enough time. All right? All right. So when it comes to kingdom giving, the Bible describes four things that mark us as kingdom givers or seed sowers as disciples. The first one, you can write these down quick. I'm going to go through these quick. But all of us are called to be cheerful givers. A kingdom giver is a cheerful giver. Okay, so the Bible says we're called to give, but it doesn't just say give. It actually gives, says to give cheerfully. 
So 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says this. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. There it is. We're, we're to give cheerfully. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, all times, all, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So I love this scripture because, one, number one, it actually gives you permission not to give if you um, are feeling shame, manipulated, guilted, or coerced. If you ever feel shame, manipulation, guilt, coercion, or you're giving to, to get God's approval or giving to get God's salvation or acceptance, you should never give. The Bible is very clear to that. But the Bible also says if that's you, you actually need to name that wound and recognize that that stole your cheerful giving. So most people, when their cheerful giving gets stifled through, through manipulation, guilt, and control, they actually stop giving and stop so, living a life of sowing seed. And they overreact. So it doesn't mean we stop giving It actually means we look in our hearts and we get back to this place of cheerful giving. So what is cheerful giving? Cheerful giving is this. You recognize that he's the one that gave it all to you in the first place. See, kingdom giving is marked by cheerfulness because you know everything comes from your heavenly father. So when you give, you give cheerfully because you're full of gratitude because you know it all came from him. If you think you're the one that provides your own needs, you're wrong. Everybody take a breath. Who took the breath? You did. Why did you take the breath? Because he gave it to you. Do you see this? So the kingdom principle of a cheerful giver is this. We demonstrate our lordship by giving back what he already gave us. Okay, so a kingdom giver is marked by cheerful giving. Number one. A kingdom giver is also marked by generosity. So everybody say generosity. Okay, Romans 12, 8. You ready for this scripture? Give generously. Short and sweet. (laughs) Give generously. Kingdom giving is always marked by generosity. And I would argue in the scripture, it is not kingdom unless it's generous. So let me, let me give you an illustration here. When um, Annika was little, love, we'll have to debrief this later, and I'll have to ask for your, forg- oh, I ask for your forgiveness now. <laughs> we used to get in the car, and I'd buy her a bag of chips. And, and she, she was like two years old, and I'd hand her the bag of chips. And we'd be driving, and uh, she had this big bag of chips, and she'd just be pounding the chips. <laughs> Preconceived forgiveness right here. <laughs> These greasy, salty, horrible chips. And I'd be like, so she's little. I'd be like, sweetie, can, can daddy have some chips? And you know what she'd do? She'd reach in the bag. And she'd sort through all the big ones. And she'd find the little crumb. <laughs> and then she'd be like, here's your chip. And then she'd be like, <laughs> eating the chips. And they're like, can I, have, can I have some chips? And she'd be like, And hand me the little chip. (laughs) It's a cute story, but it actually points to something. Kingdom giving is marked by generosity. Okay? So um, we're people who give liberally. The Lord gives us the whole thing, but we don't reach in the bag and just be like, okay, I'm going to give you as little as I can because I want it all. Who did it come from in the first place? Your father. Right? 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 So this is why Amy and I actually, we, we walk with a conviction where we, lo- we love the tithe. Because the tithe actually is a baseline for us walking out in generosity. So wh- it's a starting point for generosity. See, without that baseline of generosity, it's easy to slip into the pressures of the world where you're no longer making a following God in faith. You're, making, you're following the Lord in what is convenient. So what happens every month? We sit down with our finances. We, we take the whole amount, and then we take the gross amount, 
and we say, okay, Lord, we're going to give you our first fruits. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to give you our first fruits. Why? Because we want to exercise the responsibility of being a cheerful giver, but also a generous giver. And there are times when we write down the first fruits and we're like, whew, this is awesome. Like, wow, we get to tithe this much and we could really use this for some braces right now. Man, if we just like paid off the braces a little sooner, we'd have more. And we, we actually, sometimes for me, it's, it's more me than Amy. She's pretty rock solid. But people can slip out of generosity due to just the pressures of life. But the, for us, the tithe actually is a great way. It, it helps us give a baseline of generosity. Okay, and that, that's something we do. So that's the, that's the second thing of a ter, uh, kingdom giver. The third thing, the Bible says we're called to be faithful givers. Everybody say faithful. faithful. Okay, I love this scripture. It is required of stewards of the gospel that they be found faithful. If you're going to be a steward of the gospel... You're going to have to be marked by faithfulness. So we're a people who give faithfully. Okay? Now, this isn't just even finances. This is, this is just this is life. Okay? But we're, we're talking about kingdom finances here. Um, now, I want to go back to the tithe. Okay, so Amy and I, we talk about the tithe acts as a baseline where it helps us stay in generosity. But it also actually helps us stay in just faithfulness. Because we recognize like, wow, when we have this discipline every month, it keeps us faithful to the act of kingdom giving because we know there is no harvest without the planting of a seed. Do you see this? So it's a beautiful thing where it, 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 keeps, us, it keeps us faithful. So let me, let me give you an illustration on this. Many people treat kingdom giving like they do their gym membership. They want to get in shape. They want to get healthy. They want to exercise. So they sign up. They're like, yeah, I'm going to get a gym membership, and I'm going to start going. And they start faithfully, right? They're like, oh, this is good. But then what happens, the trials of life start stepping in. You're like, well, maybe I'm not going to go today because I'll go tomorrow. And then you, you, you get tired. You're like, ah, you start talking yourself out of it. Like, ah, I just don't feel like working out today. I'll do it tomorrow, right? How many can relate to that one? Okay. So what's that an issue of? It's an issue of faithfulness. See, exercise that is sporadic actually will lack results. And it's the same thing. Kingdom givers are faithful. But without faithfulness, you'll actually lack results in your life. Do you see this? And so it's, it's a simple concept but it's a powerful one. We as the people of God are called to be faithful, not sporadic. Amen? Is this good? Now I'm going through this quick, but these are four things that I just, I thought, I was like, wow, this helps me lock down on what it looks like to be a kingdom giver. Okay? The, the last, um, well, I'll say this. Okay. Some people say, well, faithfulness is good, but I want to avoid religious duty and obligation. Yes, 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 and amen. But I would actually argue that when you put in faithfulness around the area of giving, it no longer becomes a dutiful work, it becomes a disciplined work. And don't mix up duty with discipline. Because the Spirit of God is all about discipline. The Holy Spirit is not about obligation and duty. Does that make sense? So we live in a new covenant. So we're not under the compulsion of the law. We're actually under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And the standard of grace is that now it's God himself that helps us walk out the law. And we don't walk it out under obligation. We walk it out under intimacy, love, and overflow. So it no longer becomes something we have to do. It actually becomes a discipline we love having in our lives because it helps us stay in tune with the Spirit. Okay, last one. We're called to give sacrificially. Kingdom giving, kingdom givers are people who also give sacrificially. So we are a people who don't give when we have extra. 
that actually doesn't match what Jesus did at the cross. He didn't give just because he had extra. He gave it all. Okay? So I love 2 Samuel 24, 24. He says this. He, he goes to this king to buy sacrifices to offer a burnt offering to the Lord. And the king is so impressed with David that he's like, I'll just give it to you. And David's like, whoa, whoa, no, no, no. You cannot just give this to me. And we all know this verse. He says, I will not sacrifice to the Lord, my God, burnt offerings that cost me nothing. David wanted, wanted it to cost him something. He knew, I don't come before the Lord and give out of abundance. I always come and give out a sacrifice. A kingdom giver is someone who embraces sacrifice. Because our Lord and Savior embraced sacrifice. So let me give you one example and then I'll, I'll close here. We see this in the New Testament, the story of the widow with the few pennies, the mite. So here's Jesus. He's with his disciples, and they're watching all the people come in and give their tithes, their offerings, and their alms, right? I mean, it was not church PC of today. Seriously, Jesus has his disciples, and they're like, oh, that person gave that much. That person gave that much. I mean, like, people would freak out today if, if they did that. And by the way, the New Testament church, what they used to do is just put a basket, and people would come in in the front. Okay, so here's Jesus. They're watching, and then this widow comes in, and she gave two pennies. And the Lord stops his disciples and said, look at, look at, look at it. This woman isn't giving out of her abundance like all the others. She's giving everything. She's sacrificing it all for the kingdom of God, and it caught his attention. He was noting, we, he, he was modeling kingdom giving embraces sacrifice. See, what God is going to do in your life and in this church family is going to blow your mind. We want to keep uh, prophesying this to everybody. There is so much he's wanting to do, and it's going to require maturity, and it's also going to require the sowing of seed. And these these four things is going to help us as a church family embrace of life a sowing seed to see a harvest. So don't think a harvest will happen without your participation. God's just not going to bring you a harvest. He said when you're faithful with little, he will give you much. You have a role to play. You have participation to play. How are we going to see a harvest? By praying and presencing, by giving, by going. It's that simple. So I'll close with this and have Tim come on up. Come on up, Tim. When I was in college, I rented a house with five guys. And uh, it was a wild home. We had a lot of fun. All right? Our entire goal of, the ha of, of all five guys was to pay as little as possible to take care of this home. All right? So we wanted the benefits of the home. We wanted to live in the home. But man, when it came to fixing up the home, when it came to taking care of the home, we wanted to pay as little as possible. Why? Because we were renters. <laughs> I'm just enough to get the deposit back. But we were renters. We were renters. So we, we just kind of did as little as possible and would fix the major things so we would get our deposit back. So the hole in the wall, we fixed that. You know, the stain on the carpet, not so much. Here's my point. When I got married and we bought our first house, all of a sudden I transitioned from a renter mentality to a homeowner mentality where I'm building a home to host a family. And all of a sudden I understood, wow, I have to sow seed into our home to make it a livable condition to facilitate family life and the growth and development of my marriage, my daughters, and our future together. Do you see this? So, so much of the body of Christ actually walks with a renter's mentality because they don't understand these four principles of giving. When God calls us to be kingdom builders where we own the vision of the house and we, we walk with a homeowner mentality in our giving. Does that make sense? And this is why the statistics in the body of Christ are so unbelievable. Three to five percent people in America tithe. 10 to 20% give. The average giver, I think, is $20 a month. What's going on here? It's because most of the body of Christ approach the body of Christ as a renter mentality. They don't understand kingdom giving. 
And we want to transition from renter mentality to being disciples as a homeowner mentality. Amen? Tag. How'd I do? Josh, you did amazing. That was fantastic, Josh. Yeah. So Mary and I, when we were really young, um, I think it was like right around when Sarah was born. So this would have been 13 years ago. We had just bought our first house. Um, I was working as an electrician, but not making a ton of money. Like we were barely just scraping by. We showed up to church one night, and it was around January, beginning of January. And the pastor gets up, and he talks about first fruits. And it was this giving before you ever made money. So before you started your year, I'm going to give an amount of money because I believe God's going to bless me in the next year. And we were like, oh, okay. And then he says, so individually, if you're married, individually, I want you to pray and ask God, how much do you want us to give? So Mary and I separately were like, okay, God, how much do you want? We come together. And I'm like, I heard $500. And Mary goes, oh, my gosh, I heard $500. We're like, where are we going to get $500? We don't have $500. Where are we going to get $500? So we look at our bank account. We had $500 in our bank account. So we wrote the check. We put it in the offering. I, we left Sunday. I think it was actually a Saturday night at the time. We were doing Saturday night services. I walked into work Monday morning, and my boss goes, Adam, come here. And I walk into his office, and he goes, so you've been doing a really good job. I'm going to give you a raise. And the exact dollar amount was the exact, it was $500 every month increase than what we were, that I was making before that. So God can do anything if you're hearing you're supposed to do it. He can do it. Amen. Gosh, that was awesome. Thank you, Adam. We love stories like that. And I have hundreds of those kind of supernatural stories when it comes to finances. One of the number one invitations that we have is to be builders. And, you know, Jesus said there's two great commandments. Experience God's love, love him back, and then love other people as yourself, include your enemies. And then after the two great commandments, uh, based upon those two great commandments, we have a great commission. And the great commission is about building. It's about making disciples or building lives. So the number one commitment of a church family is to build, but what do we build? We build lives. We build healthy lives, lives in Christ, kingdom lives, lives that are of people that the first thing we do when we inherit somebody to steward their life, we begin praying, I do, about where are the strongholds, where are the lies, where are the uh, oppressive dynamics in their life that are keeping them from moving forward. So we want freedom. So one of the first things we do when we build a life uh, is we, we fight for their freedom. Mindsets that are jamming them up. Then we, we fight for a sense of belonging because in that context of belonging, uh, we have a family connection and there we have access now to a person's identity. And we build identity because we act like who we think we are. We act according to our identity. And it takes a family to tell you the truth about who you really are to displace the lies of what you think you are from a demonic and fallen world. So a real family builds sons and daughters, identity in the Father, and we cooperate with God in bringing, quote he says in Hebrews, many sons to glory. We help a person move from immaturity, from one level of glory to the next level of glory to the next level of glory so they mature through the sequences of maturity. We build lives by helping people get their identity, get a sense of their value, get a sense of their destiny, and then move them forward, move them forward in gospel truth. We do that in this family. We build lives in a context called J3s. We've called them DNA groups, Discipleship, Nurture, Apostolic Mission. We've called them J3s. We're sticking with J3s because it's Jesus plus three. It seems, it seems relational more than chemical. 
So J3s, three people plus Jesus with their hearts open, they're of one mind and of one heart, and they, and they draw from the life of the Word, they draw from the life of the Spirit, they draw from the life of Christ in one another. The Christ in me communes with the Christ in you because we're connected. And in that connection, that attachment, we exchange life, 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 life. Because it takes life to grow. It takes life to become. It takes life to mature. So we're all about life. We're a family that builds lives through life. The life of the, that's in the Word. The life that's in the Spirit. The life that's in Christ when we come together. So we're builders. Building is a lot of fun because um, when you're in it long enough, you can actually see what happens when life is started and then it grows. So we've seen a lot of lives get birthed in this house. We've seen people actually come to Christ and get reborn in this place. They get born again in this context of this family. We have a number of those experiences. And then we follow that up with water baptism. So that's a sign of we're getting catapulted into a new, a new way of being, a new life. So that's what we do. We make life. We birth life. Then we raise life in a family. In J3s, we raise life. Then we have kingdom families. Those are, you know, so J3s are Peter, James, and John. It's Jesus plus three. And Jesus built this way. He bonded with three men. He imparted the ways of the kingdom to them. He built these men into men of God. They were scared, nervous, disenfranchised young boys, and he turned them into men in the kingdom. That's discipleship. Then in that J3 setting, the J3s are part of a kingdom family. Jesus had 12, so a kingdom family can be anywhere from whatever, five to maybe 20, but it needs to multiply at that point because too many folk. We launched, uh, we've been launching K, uh, Jesus uh, families, vibrant families of Jesus or kingdom families, and I'm watching already the bonding taking place, the love getting exchanged, the trust is growing, and we'll begin to address key issues in a person's life so that they can fulfill the destinies God given to them. There's nothing more fun than to be in a J3 or a kingdom family where people are fighting for you, rooting for you, praying for you, recognizing who you are in the spirit, bombarding you with the gospel, telling you the truth about your true self, letting your true self displace your false self. Nothing more fun than that. Nothing more fun than to build a life. And, you know, a lot of times people think that that responsibility falls into the hands of the, quote, paid clergy. Or, you know, no, 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 no. The role that Josh and I have and Amy and Janet and the other leaders and the CBEX and uh, Andrew and Jess, the role we have is to equip you to build lives. It's the equipping of you into leadership. It's not to do it for you. It's to equip you to do it. We equip you to do the work of ministry. We equip you to fulfill the destiny and calling of God in your life. Now, this is how we started Rock Laramie. 17, 16, 17 years ago. We started it around the agreement to make disciples that were so potent that they could, they could enter into culture. They could enter into the marketplace or into the schools, into Unawayo, into the university, into high schools and junior highs. They could go into businesses and they could bring the kingdom in these jurisdictions of life. And so we've watched kingdom businesses. We've watched businesses become kingdom businesses. We've watched marriages become kingdom marriages. We've watched people change over, over days, weeks, months, and years. I just got a text from Patrick and Liz. They walked in here. We kind of looked at them. They were a beautiful couple living together. Ken and Barbie is what I call them. Ken and Barbie. They walked in. I said, "Hey, okay, Ken and Barbie. And they were like, wow, we're really nervous, this is brand new, we, we haven't really developed a, 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 a relationship together around the Lord, and so, you know, because of the outreach of our family, they just, they just started getting drawn into the story, and the minute they, they did, they, they embraced growth. They said, okay, mess with us, make us into disciples, that's basically what they said, mess with us. 
mess with our lives, get into our life, figure out where we're jacked up, help us to understand what we're supposed to be. How does this marriage thing work? Because we're not married. How do, how do we do this in the kingdom? They never, you know, we gave them a Bible. Right back here, we just took up one of, the, one of the Bible here. Have a Bible. Brand new. I mean, like, okay, read this book. Read, read out of, uh, I think I told him, read John, the Gospel of John. We'll talk about it. Talk about John. Well, Patrick started reading out of the Bible. He started coming to our connections group. Patrick and Liv. Liz, and the next thing you know, they're getting filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit. Then they, then they, they come to me and say, huh, the Lord told us we need to get married. I said, well, that's good. We never talked to them about that stuff. We never said, hey, you got to do this. We just started talking about following Jesus. So they got married. Yeah, but that, that way to marriage was uh, dicey. And I'm not, anything that they haven't shared here. But they said that had it not been for the disciple making of their lives individually and together, they sent me a picture and said, thank you for this church for loving us because we wouldn't have this little baby boy if it hadn't been for the rock. So here's a picture of the cutest little boy ever. Ken and Barbie make really pretty babies. And the little pretty ba boy, and they go, we owe this life to the coaching because we wouldn't have made it. We wouldn't have made it. And I'm like, okay, now that, that, that makes me want to sign up to build. I want to build. I want to build life. I want to be at the end of my life having said, I invested in people to become like Jesus in the context of family. And absolute change did take place over many years of time. And people can look back and go, had it, at this hothouse ecosystem of in this this ecosystem of grace and mentoring produce life in my life. I'm not the same today as I would have been had I not engaged proactively in making disciples. That's what we make around here. That's our, our, our company business. What's our product? Disciples. Disciples like Jesus who influence the world. That's what we make. And disciples become leaders Leaders are influencers. Leaders take on responsibility for other lives. And they go, you know, I'm going to wake up. It's not just about me now. It's about other people. And I'm going to feel the weight, the joy of being a conduit of their growth. I'm going to do that. I'm going to invest in them. I'm going to do a J3. I'm going to get in a kingdom family. I'm going to learn what they're trying to teach me. And then, <laughs> then you grow. And by helping someone else grow, you actually grow faster. It's actually how it works. The best way to grow is to help somebody else grow. The best way to learn is to be a teacher who teaches others. So the more you give out, the more you give out, the more you're going to find yourself expanding under the influence of the Spirit and the Word. So we make disciples. That's what we make. And uh, <clears throat> how many of you have ever participated in a corporate building enterprise? Like you just bought in and said, I'm going to join this company, or I'm going to join this team, or I'm going to, together, together, we're going to build something. How many of you have ever done a corporate strategy of building? Raise your hand if you've ever done that. Like Shram would be a corporate agenda. Together, we're going to make disciples. We're going to have trans transformational experiences in wilderness. We're all going to root together. Somebody's going to pack the food. Somebody's going to lead the course. Somebody's going to be back home answering the phone. But together, we're going to get this thing done. We're going to get people changed on the side of a mountain. Okay, that, that's a corporate building game plan. Now, this is huge to buy into a corporate strategy. A corporate because it takes a family, it takes a tribe to raise a person. No one person should ever be entrusted with disciple making another person alone. That's not how it works in the kingdom. The Trinity assured us of that. It takes a family to raise a, a son or daughter. So it takes a corporate buy in. Everybody's got a buy in. Everybody's got a buy in. When Larry and Nancy walk back in through the door, I, might, I could breathe again a little bit more because they feel, fill a very big space in this family. They help start connections. They were right in the beginning of this church family. 
They have helped become platform people. The minute we got this building, Larry pulls out his paintbrush and starts, run, you know, jumping in on things. I mean, he's like, I can't have this color in this building. And so he, he's like going for it. So I, I'm like weight bearers, responsible weight bearers. People with a parental heart are here to help pull the plow, pick up the weight of this family life. All right, so, but the buy-in for some people takes time. It's like, do I really, am I going to be a spectator? And I, am I going to consume what this church has to offer? Or am I going to be an investor builder? Am I going to be an investor builder or a consumer recipient? And it's, it's valid to walk around a group of people and like you would buy a used car, kick the tires, open the door, slam the door, open the door, start the engine, check it out. It's okay to walk in and figure out, are these my people? That's, that, there's a process to that because we, we, we want to attach and we want to attach a long time. Attaching and attaching a long time is really where the fun hits. Because there's people in this room we started investing in when they were little, little boys. Little, little boys. And little, little boys grow up to want to date and marry women. And to be able to be a tribe where little boys get raised to be men and then they find their wives in the tribe, that's a satisfying moment. That's a satisfying moment. We got one of those weddings next month with one of those stories. That's a satatisfying corporate story. Well, we've, and we've got other ones besides Derek in the room. So anyway, anyway, here's what I'm trying to get at. There comes a point where we say in our spirit, I've been invited to be a member and an owner of the company. Like I'm not just a, I'm not just a consumer, I'm an owner. And when we move to owning, there's something really awesome about that. Like, I can tell when somebody buys in and owns the story. It, it's just like a, I don't know, it's like night and day almost. They're locked in, and we're in there together, and it's always usually a bit messy because family life is messy. There's always issues and problems you're trying to solve. People are always manifesting their trauma, pain, their attachment pain, their issues, their immaturities. Everything, all that is going on in a family. Insecurities, immaturities, woundings, traumas, but that's family. There is no other family like that. I mean, go find one and I'll join it. Go find a perfect family that's building well and, and that's perfect. Dude, let's just close this thing down and go join them. But we have been formed. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah, that would ruin Exactly. Then we'd ruin it because Josh and I showed up. You just mess it up, mess up the whole atmosphere. So, so, um, so what, what we've never done, really, this is going to be a, a first-time thing. We've never actually, and it's not that we've been secretive. I guess we've done it somewhat in the past. But we've never actually said, as a family, this is our operating budget. Now, every, every building, every army has a war chest every army has a war chest every family has a budget has an understanding of what they got to do if they're going to be a responsible family they got to know what what is involved in making it happen so i've had the fun of planning churches over my lifetime that are still going they're still vibrant it was really fun to go back to a church we planted in in wisconsin and now they're, they're tapping into the Jesus men's training. It's how James and Yenny ended up here from Wisconsin. But it's really fun to have invested in the building of a vibrant family and to have that thing continually influencing the region. That's so much fun to have done that. And I don't care how long you're here, the greatest thing you can do is buy in deeply to a family understand what they're doing and why, buy into the curriculum, buy into the vision, buy into the core values,
because they're all biblical, buy into the game plan of what's going on, and then jump in hard, jump in big, jump in with everything you got, because that activates. When you jump in with everything you got, it activates the grace of God in a way I don't even know how to describe it. Like, I didn't dabble in my marriage with Janet. Like, I, I went to Janet, and uh, gosh, she met me when I was 17 or some crazy amount of numbers like that. But we started, I, I was, we were both going to graduate together. I got through co college quickly so I could graduate with her. And I proposed to her, I'm maybe 19 or 20. It was ridiculous, but it was, I did it. And, but I remember when I, when I said I do, I was literally sweating around my, the gills. I was like, this is for real. One woman, the rest of my life, I'm going to lay my life down. And I literally remember 20s, breaking out in acne. <laughs> breaking out in acne at my, you know, the, the, the day before my wedding because I was so nervous about the mandate I was being given to, to be like Jesus to this woman. And I knew this girl is taking a big risk. Big risk. But she did it. All right, so we began forming a family budget right away. And I said, Janet, we got to tithe. We got to tithe. Tithe is not legalistic. It was, tithe is 10%. It's not legalistic. We were two kids that didn't have jobs, that didn't have a house, that were just brought into graduate school. Uh, we, all we, that we had was given to us. It was used. It wasn't even worth hauling across the country. In my, now I would never do it. But um, we got married, I'm 20, she's 22, we jump in a trailer, we have no home, no jobs, and a massive bill waiting for us to start that fall. Dude. And I announced to Janet, we're going we're gonna to cooperate with heaven, we're going to risk it all. We're going to be w fully into the kingdom. And she was raised as a, as a little farm girl in Nebraska, and they... They never knew if their crops would fail or this or that. So they were very Scott Irish in the way they interacted with Jesus and money. And I said, Janet, we got, there's a new worldview, and that is we're going to tithe and give offerings and we're going to invest. So we bought into the kingdom and to the king, and we started to become builders and investors in a purpose. To this day, I'm, I'm like I'm 20 and I start junior high ministry in this church. They brought me in. And to this day, I'm Facebook friends with a ton of these junior high kids that we led to the Lord. And it was just, I love living like this. So this is not a sales pitch. This is an invitation into really fun stuff. And one more point. We've been growing. We, we were only a handful of people back 16, 17 years ago, right, y'all? We were just a handful of people believing and dreaming for city transformation, believing and dreaming for a culture of disciple-making, experiential training, relational training. We understood the role of wilderness. We understood the role of relational discipleship. We've been on this journey, waffling in and out of it for a long time, trying to get better and better. We know more now about how to help people get healed, delivered, and mature than we ever did because we said yes to this mandate. We know so much more now. God sent so many more people to us because we laid our lives down for this purpose. So really, most of you in this room weren't around 16, 17 years ago. But because of something... The Lord drew you here, and you're going to begin a journey of transformation, not only for yourself, but helping someone else, because God sovereignly set you in this tribe. So every once in a while, it's really good for a leadership to come along and say, there was a time we weren't even together. I mean, there was a time I never knew Josh and Amy. I never knew Mary or, or Drew. I never knew Andrew or Jess. But then God sovereignly put us together, and then some explosion of life and light and goodness started happening in the kingdom. And a handful of people began to buy in. We never had this building for years. So here we are now, and you're here now. And it's worth extending an invitation to say to you guys periodically, do what we did. 
just jump the heck in. Just jump in. And so this is our budget. This is what it's going to, this is our war chest. This is what we need to do our war chest in order to equip, to, to make lives, to build lives. And um, we're not going to answer any big specific questions today, but I just want you to look at it a minute. Oh, I need one. <laughs> I don't have it memorized. Almost do, but not. So we worked hours and hours on this, right, Josh? Our leadership team, we really try to make it conservative, workable, real. But this, these are the real numbers. Now, there was a day we rented the, the library once a month or the hotel. We rented a hotel once a month. Then there was the quadradingle dangle is what I call it. We rented the quadradingle dangle. And then there was a day when the Lord spoke clearly to us about this facility. And it was outrageous, the deal we got. And it's an amazing gift that God's given to us. But all of these things have happened chipping away, building together. So just the general category, this is what... We're trying to do to be a full-service kingdom family that makes disciples and impacts the world. There's some world missions in here. There's a lot of uh, finances committed to keeping a facility up and running so we can do other special training like tonight with the Jesus men. Weddings like what we had in here. We've had in here weddings. Who's been married in this room? Tim... Tim's been married, wedded, uh, wedded in this room. So we've had other people wedded in this room. So this is a holy space, we think. So there's a, it, it's, it's not like we build a kingdom through buildings, but this building has been an instrument or a tool. The connections gets together that has been on Wednesday. They start in the kitchen, the kitchen that Mark and, and, and Bob worked on and others of you. That kitchen has become a place of life. It's a space of life. And we've done a lot of cooking. A lot of families have lived in this building. And they've experienced life in this space. So there's some, some costs involved in the building. There's costs involved in our live streaming. We feel like that's an important thing for us to do. To get the word out around the country and the world. So there's some other... There are some, um, God does compensate elders. Uh, we, we are both, Josh and I, on part-time income, and we have, so we subsidize our income with companies or businesses and some support raising. So we have tried to keep these thi this thing really, really tight and conservative. We'd love to see this thing double. But this is where we're at right now in our family life. Again, we can answer questions specifically down the road because we don't want to have a business meeting right now. We just want to get the heart of things. And a lot of people, this shocks them. They think, wow, this little family, it takes $225,760 a year to run that budget. Well, I've been... Uh, I've been a founder and executive pastor of a mega church, and our budget was in the millions, in the millions. I'm not saying that, um, so this may, I don't know how this hits you, but this is a pretty conservative budget for the type of vision that this family has. Now, our goal is to raise up disciples and leaders so that we can have an ever-expanding J3s and ever-expanding kingdom families. So the people in my new, our new, the Cannons and the Johns' new kingdom family, I think there's now 15 adults and two children. So they're all aware we're going to work hard on discipleship. We're going to learn how to learn the word. We're going to learn how to move in the Holy Spirit. And we're getting relational and emotional skills and maturity to love well. And so every time we get together, there's some coaching. There's some connecting. There's some ministry to the Lord. 
So that's where, this is kind of a prototype of what we want to do in terms of intentional disciple making. And then I coach other kingdom family leaders in other states like Colorado and Missouri and Kansas and Montana, uh, down in Missouri and Springfield. So more and more, we've got a couple coming from Carolinas at Tribal. They want to learn J3s and discipleship in threes. They want to learn kingdom family life. And so this place has become a point of reference or resource for other church plants around the country. By a church plant, I'm talking about people becoming a family to grow in Jesus and to reach the world for Christ. So this is who we are. And for a little church, we've sponsored a lot of things at a lot of levels. And we really want to focus on making Rock Laramie a vibrant, vibrant church. So we're going we're gonna to kind of suspend some of, the, uh, some of the responsibilities we've been picking up for the tribe, for the larger tribe. One, by not having a tribal gathering next year. And some other things that we're going to suspend. But we're going to focus hard on disciple making and building a, a very vibrant local church. And part of the reason is this. We know we've been promised that from God that we're to steward an influx of a lot of new believers. We believe a harvest is coming and we are getting ready for the harvest. That means we need to get you ready for the harvest so you know what you're doing when you get a new believer. You know what you're doing. And so the goal is we'll help you to know what to do when you get a new believer under your care. So when Jan and I started this family of ours, um, we're up in Tacoma, Washington, and um, we did have a miscarriage on our first child. It was really painful. And then our second child was Alyssa. Um, but I remember us getting prepared for Alyssa years in advance because we, we wanted a daughter, we wanted a son so badly. So we started remodeling our home. Janet started picking out wallpaper. We started getting cribs going on. We started getting this and that. Wouldn't you know, when Alyssa gets born, um, the day before her birth, Mount St. Helens blew up and, and ash was everywhere. So I had to go in, you know, at three in the morning, I'm like this frantic father thinking if she breathes this ash, she might die, might be radioactive. So I'm literally preparing and scrubbing every nook and cranny of this house to prepare for this little baby to arrive in the home. You prepare for life. You prepare for life. If you're caring, you're loving, and you see the need for the gospel and the kingdom, you prepare. Now, this world is not in good shape. Y'all know that, right? The depression rates, the, the, the dysfunction, the emotional trauma, the suicide rates, the addiction rates, the depression rates in young people... It's beyond anything we've ever seen in, in our nation's statistics. We are not in a good place as a nation. The only antidote is salt and light that comes from a kingdom family that gets it, that gets the power of love and disciple making. So in my opinion, you know, I've built, I've remodeled homes, we've built homes, we've built businesses. This would be something like this, like Shane would understand this, business people would understand this. If you get together a group of people and say, we're going to build a business, we're going to build a company, we're going to produce a product, you get a blueprint, you get a plan. Now, it always adjusts, right? It's always fluid. But you get a game plan, you get a vision, you get a budget. And then... You, because you are confident that God's on it, you go and do your plan. You work it. You invest in it. You give your life for it. That's why we're here today. That's how we're here today. Never did we think it would be as, you know, as many as empty chairs as we got here today. Never did we think we'd be this full. But I know from that I know that there will be a day when... We, we will have multiplying kingdom families, multiplying J3s, and our Sunday mornings will have more and more uh, engagement. So, this is a budget. 
Is this land good? Exciting? Diane, you came at the right time. They talk about money in the rock truck. That's like, what a great day to show up. So, any, any, I'm not, I don't want to ask any specific questions on the budget, but is there any, um, you know what it might be cool is for Mark, why don't you just come up and take a minute and talk about this place and this investment that you've made, you and Liz, and what it's meant. That's putting you on the spot. If you want to, if you'd like to, I'd love that. Just come on up here, Mark, and because you were one of the early adopters when we sequestered your business. I'm just asking for you to just say whatever's on your heart. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's wide open. Yeah. That is. So, thanks. Um, specifically with this building, I was against buying it <laughs> originally. I was like, oh, it's going to ruin us. We, we do house church. It won't be the same. Uh, but it has been super helpful, super useful, uh, obviously very good for our tribal gathering, but also lots of folks have stayed here. A lot of things have happened here, and I see uh, eventually more chair. we'll need more chairs, let me put it that way. You mean better chairs? Yeah. Oh, better, better <laughs> chairs, better chairs first. Okay, there then, we go, we'll put that in the budget. Then more chairs. Um, <laughs> But yeah, we bought in a long time ago. That was uh, 14 years ago now, by Amazing. the way. Yes. And we have been a part of this adventure of both running and growing this church. Uh, I don't know. What else do you want? <laughs> that was beautiful. A little bit of history is the Holy Spirit led Josh and Tim to Mark's company oh. over by the police station. And... Um, to ask if they could use his building for church, <laughs> for the men's meeting, and then it became Sundays yes. and, and stuff. So they started out very small. They were in the Ramada, and then they looked out and saw his, and God led them to Mark's company, which then led us and the Bullers to the church. And so it was very cool. And then to see it grow, from place to place to place, and then to receive this building um, was amazing. Um, it, yeah, that's it's it's truly is amazing. Yeah, you have to realize, Tim shows up at my office door at five o'clock at night. <laughs> There's only Shane and I working in the building at that point. <laughs> knock, knock, knock. Right. Fortunately, he brought Andrew and Josh with him because I didn't know Tim from. Adam. Right. And I was like, who is this guy? <laughs> who is this guy? And, uh, and so we talked for like 45 minutes, and I asked the other two guys if we could uh, let them use the building, because in my thinking, it would be a residual blessing, kind of like when you have the Ark of the Covenant. Residual blessing. And uh -huh. Okay, that's my it. selfish thinking. I figured, whatever. Uh, it was true. It, well, there was a huge blessing on our on our office and our uh, company, but um, I also felt more affirmed and, and encouraged in my faith in that 45 minutes than I had in years. Mm -hmm. And so it was shortly after that I went to Liz and I said, "I think we have to change churches." So mm -hmm. that was the beginning of a wow. long and glorious friendship. Long and glorious, <laughs> amazing, yeah. amazing. Thank you, guys. Yeah, there, there's so many fun stories to tell that I thought, thank you for being spontaneous, Mark and Liz. Yeah, that's a cool story. So there's so many cool stories. So let's stand up. And yep. um, Tim, thank you for bringing this to us. And we, we just really want to encourage transparency and honesty. And we want everybody to know, what does it take to operate this family? And so, so please... Um, take this. If you have questions, come to us. Talk to us about this. Um, ask questions. We welcome questions. We welcome feedback. We welcome curiosity. And so um, we really want to model transparency. We really want to model responsibility. What you're seeing there is a responsible budget. It's not a reckless budget by no means. Okay, and so we really want that faith that to raise up faith in this church family because where we're going. Uh, we're being serious about making disciples. And so we thought one thing to, to close this up, Tim and I, is we'd love to just pray 
over one another for kingdom giving and advancement in your life. And so when I when I say kingdom giving, it's not just it's not just finances. It's it's you being somebody who gives out of the abundance of the kingdom with your life to everybody around you. Okay, so let's take a few minutes and let's just bless one another and pray for breakthrough and kingdom giving in our in our individual lives. And then also take a moment and pray just for abundance in, the, in this church family and uh, for us to continue to mobilize a people who build disciples, make disciples, create disciples, and pray a, a blessing on this church family. So can we do that real quick? So let's turn on a little background music or we can have somebody come up and pray either way. Uh, play. Um, well, well, since you're here, one of them, come on and play. But let's, let's bless one another with kingdom giving, and then pray. Just pray for the prosperity of this church family to go for an, to another level. Amen? All right. So find your person. Let's do those two things. We love you.